Hello everyone, so good to have you back at House of Refuge Church, Pastor James Jeffries. I want to talk to you about free. It's very expensive. No one could afford it. So is free really free? Well, let's look at some things this morning. Here in Isaiah 51, Scripture says, the Amplified Bible, Everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and you who have no money, come buy grain and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Simply accept it as a gift from God. Okay? So here in Isaiah, it's telling you to come and buy this stuff for free. So it's, it's an expression of just basically saying it's a free gift, but somebody else is paying for it. Okay? That's the whole idea. Say, so come. Come on and eat. And uh, you don't have to have any money because it's all free. But somebody else has paid for it. Here in Romans 6, 33, in the Amplified, it says, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God, that is, his remarkable, overwhelming gift of grace to believers is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So what he's saying is, is that God has given the free gift that Jesus Christ has paid for. Okay? Here in Ephesians 2, 8 through 9, Amplified Bible. For it is by grace, God's remarkable compassion and favor, drawing you to Christ, that you have been saved, actually delivered from judgment and given eternal life through faith. And this salvation is not of yourselves, not through your own effort, but it is the undeserved, gracious gift of God. Okay? So, right here we see that there's a judgment coming upon people that don't receive Christ. But this grace that God has given us is because we believe that Jesus died for us and we became saved, which is salvation. Okay? And it is remarkable because Jesus paid that price on the cross so that we can now accept what he's done for us because we couldn't do it. I'll explain a little bit more as we get to some other parts. Not as a result of your works, okay? So it's not by any works. You know, reading your Bible through in a year doesn't add to it. Being baptized in water doesn't add to it. Um, you know, doing sacraments doesn't add to it, okay? It's the works that Christ has done. He did all the works. He labored and he walked that walk with the cross on his back and with nail to the cross and, and went through all that pain and suffering with being beat with that cat of nine tails and all that labor he went through is the works and the only works that God will accept. And uh, us going to do things and say, oh, well, look, I, I go to church every week and I read my Bible all the time so I know I'm a good person. I hear people tell me all the time, well, you know, this... This lady here, I know she's in heaven because, boy, she would pray every night and she would do these religious prayers. And, you know, I remember those prayers in my head. She was praying every night. You know, I know she's in heaven. She's a saint. That didn't get her into heaven. What got her into heaven, if she's there, is her faith in Jesus Christ. And then she got that free gift of salvation. Okay? Talk a little more in just a minute. 1 Corinthians 6. In the Amplified Bible, it says, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is within you, whom you have received as a gift? Okay? We were given this gift of the Holy Spirit from God and that you are not your own property. I don't own this body anymore. I don't own my own life because somebody purchased me. You were bought with a price. You were actually purchased with the precious blood of Jesus and made his own. So then, honor and glorify God with your body. So there was a price that was paid. So it's free. We receive it freely, all right? But it cost a tremendous price. Now the idea is that <clears throat> it was very, very expensive. And the reason why I wrote in the title that no one could afford it 
is because it will cost you your life, okay, if you were to try to pay for your sins. And because you have sins, Jesus didn't have any sin, and but we do. And in order to pay the price, we would have to go and get separated from God for eternity. Okay, because there's no way that I can buy back through doing good works all the sins that I've done. You know, it just will not balance out one way or the other. I mean, there's no way you can. And uh, we're born with a sin nature. You can't get rid of it. It's going to take Christ giving us a new body in, in order to get rid of that sin nature. But the idea is that you can't, you cannot go die and pay for all your sins because you would be separated from God because of your rejection of Christ. All right? So God requires a balance. Now, say, well, why didn't God just do it another way? Because he's God. All right? I already talked about this in another video. God created all things and everything created by him. That means he's the one that has made the rules. His rules are what he is. He cannot deny himself. So if he says that we cannot pay for our own sins because we, we are sinners, we have a sin nature, so the only way we can pay for it is to go to hell, separation from God for eternity. Or someone can come who was perfect, who had no sin, to balance out. You see, I'm going to show you the scriptures in Romans in just a minute. But how Adam sinned and brought the whole human race into a sin nature. And gave us all, we all born with a sin nature. We sin. This is what we do from, from day one. And we don't even know that we're sinning. We're just sinning because it's part of our nature. Christ came and had no sin nature because his father was God. Adam didn't have a sin nature before he, he ate of the tree. And so he plunged us into a sin now Jesus came as the perfect balance of those two, died on the cross, had no sin, took our own sins upon himself. And so now we don't do any works to get saved, except what we do is we believe. We believe by faith that Jesus paid the price. When people in this world reject Christ, and they don't want to come to him, and they refuse to do it, and so forth, well, the only place that they can go is to be separated from God. They don't want Christ, so they're going to be separated from God. And the only place that they can go to where God doesn't go, he can if he wants, but he doesn't, is, is the place called hell. Sheol in the Bible, in Hades it talks about. When, and it's all the same place. And eventually into the lake of fire. Because they willfully, of their own free will, have rejected Christ. They don't, they don't want to trust and believe in him and, and be a follower of Jesus Christ. So the only place they can go when they die is to be separated from God, okay? And I already got videos on all of that stuff, but right now I'm just coming to the... I want people to come to that reality of, the, of how much it cost. You, you couldn't pay it, you know? It's like, you know, I have a little... I got a few dollars in the bank, all right? And the cost is a thousand times, a million times higher than what I could even pay. All right? And so I don't care how rich a person is. The Bible says, what will it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? What if he owned the entire world, all the gold and silver and everything precious, the diamonds, the rubies, everything, and you, and you put a price on this world, all right, of the value of every diamond, of every piece of, uh, every ounce of gold and silver and brass and copper and everything else, and say it came to a number, oh man, in the, you just can't even come up with a number, it would be, but yet, it wouldn't be enough to pay for a person's soul. If you say, I own the world, God, I'll give you the whole world and let me come to heaven, you, don't, you still don't have enough. It's way, it's way beyond. Suppose a person owned the whole universe. Imagine what that would, the value of that, it wouldn't be enough. Okay? Because what would be required would be a balance between the one who failed and the one who has come to buy our freedom. Okay? 
salvation. It has to be that. That would be the only true balance that there is. Now, I put this here because of what I just finished talking about, but the price of an object, no matter what that object is, you go into a store and you want to buy a toaster, okay, blender, whatever, the price of an object is equal to the value of that object, okay? You go in and the, and the object costs $30. Well, that's what they, what they say the value of that object you buy in is. You go buy a car, pay $30,000 for it. They say the car that you're buying is valued at $30,000. You give us $30,000, we give you the car, okay? You pay on time, so forth. You go pay $30 for the object, a toaster, and you get the toaster, and the business gets the $30. I mean, that's so easy, okay, to understand. And, uh, but no, be, believe me, many people don't understand that. So, even in our worldly life we live in, everything is balanced based upon value, all right? So, for a person to be able to go to heaven, there's a value on that, okay? In order to make it to heaven, God has set the price. And that price has to be equal to the problem. Okay, the, the, the object is to get a sinner into a righteous place. Okay, so it takes someone else to do it. Someone that would be equal to what that one or that person was before he sinned. So Adam was perfect. He didn't have a sin nature. His father was God. He didn't have a mom and dad. God created him and formed him. So he had no sin nature. He was perfect and God told him, don't touch the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And then Eve ate first, nothing happened. Adam ate, everything bad happened. And so it's really of the two, the balance things out is one was a sinner and went into sin. The other one was righteous and went into righteousness. We're going to see that right now. I'm going to talk about these scriptures in, in Romans. Romans 5, 6 through 12, we're going to look at these scriptures. And it says, when we were utterly helpless, in other words, there was no way we could pay the price. We were living in sin. It was an automatic thing. Say, so, well, I don't think I sin all that much. You'd be surprised how much you sin. Scripture says that anything less than faith is sin. So when you're doubting, when you're fearful, and all of that sin. When, when uh, you say you have no sin, you're a liar. And you, we full of sin. We're constantly sinning. All right? Then we get saved, and the Holy Spirit begins to convict us of these sins. So it says, when we were utterly helpless, we had no way to make it to heaven. All right? Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. So the idea is that righteous people could not go to heaven. They actually went into hell, but they went into paradise. Eden was moved down into the lower parts of the earth, and Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and all the righteous would go there. But they couldn't go into heaven, so they were in prison down there, but they were in paradise. Then across this great abyss was the torment side. There's a story in, in um, Luke 6:16 6, talks about the rich man, the poor man, and it describes it. Rich man went to the torment side, Lazarus, the poor man, went to, to the paradise side. The two thieves on the cross, one railed on Christ, he wound up in, in the torment side. And the other man said, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus said, this day you'll be with me in paradise. So when Jesus died, that guy was already there. And they, and they both were in paradise. And Jesus did what he did in hell. He didn't suffer he took the keys of death, hell, and the grave. He preached to the captives. And then he took all those righteous and paradise and came on up and brought them into heaven. Ephesians tells us that, that he led captivity captive. He took them into heaven, opened the gates of heaven, put his blood on the mercy seat, sat down at the right hand of the Father. And all these righteous are now in heaven with him. And they're in liberty. They're in liberty because they're in heaven. So now when we die, we don't have to go into paradise. Paradise is in heaven now. We go up into heaven. And then later on, our bodies get changed to be and put on incorruption. And we have a body to connect with the new heavens and the new earth. Okay? So that's a lot I said. I'm not explaining all of that too much. Because I just want to talk about this basic truth. So, Christ came at just the right time. Okay? And, um, and brought in the new covenant. 
and pay the price for the sinners. And it says, now most people would not be willing to die for an unright person. Though someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who is especially good. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. Okay? So, let's see. It's like this. I was still sinning. And the Holy Spirit's moving upon me. And I realize, you know, about heaven. And I realize I need a Savior. And I realize that I was going to die and go to hell. The Holy Spirit makes that known to every person on the planet. He speaks to people in the, in the wee hours of the morning, it says in Job 33. It says that he speaks to them at the wee hours of the morning to turn them from their wicked path. So all through the word of God, we see that angels are gone out and ministering to people. And uh, telling them about salvation, giving them dreams. God's giving them dreams and visions. Everybody. That one person goes to hell accidentally. All right? They either reject those dreams, reject that truth that the angel brings, reject the truth that missionaries bring, and on and on it goes. Whoever's bringing the truth to them, they reject all of that to believe in their false religion or some other trash or just, just want to live in sin. When they die and they don't and they have not believed in Christ, well, they'll be separated from God, you know, which would be sending them to hell. But it, but the thought isn't so much hell itself; it's just the place that they are separated from. When a person breaks the law, they wind up in prison. It's a prison. It's a holding place until the white throne judgment, where they will wind up in a lake of fire. But anyway, well, what he's saying here in these scriptures is that. Hardly will the person die for uh, a stranger. Maybe you know, people do. They are heroes out there that do that. But he's saying how hardly they will do that. But Jesus died for all sinners. Now, because he died for me as a sinner, then now I can turn to Christ and receive that price that was paid. Okay? He paid it with his blood when he died on the cross. And it says, and since we have been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, he will certainly save us from God's condemnation. So what he's saying is, is that there is judgment coming. Okay? No way around it. He's going to judge this world of sin. There is the book of Revelation that talks about the great tribulation that's coming. And the wicked's going to be shook to the core. And, they, and yet many will not come to Christ even at with the shaking and with the judgment God's pouring out. But we can escape all of that in the rapture. We can escape all of that when we, if we die before that righteous and go to heaven. We can escape all of that. That's called the condemnation of God when he condemns the wickedness of this world. He's going to judge every sin. The Bible lists all the sins. You can go read them in Corinthians and other places in the Bible. And um, you could see who will not go to heaven. And these people have to repent and turn. Yeah, they're still going to be struggling and fighting and fail. But then the Holy Spirit in them will cause them to repent. And they will be broken. They don't want to sin, you see. So on and on that goes. So then in verse 10 it says, For since our friendship with God was restored by the death of his son while we were still his enemies, we will certainly be saved through the life of his son. So in other words... He paid for death. He went into hell, but he went to the he went to the good side. Took away the keys of death, hell, and the grave. So you don't have to worry about death anymore. As you're a Christian, you might die physically, but you won't die spiritually. Okay, and then through his life, his resurrection, we too will rise. We will have eternal life because of his life. So he took away death from us. That spiritual death, separation from Christ. I mean, from Christ and God the Father. And that's what spiritual death's about. Physical death is not a big deal. Your physical body dies. And then your spirit and soul stands before the judgment seat of Christ. And if you reject Christ, then you're gone into hell. If you receive him as your Lord and Savior, then you'll go into heaven. Okay? So there's going to be that judgment. Not the white throne judgment. It's the judgment seat of Christ that will take place. The two judgments. That one that before Christ, he decides whether you're going to heaven or hell. That's a holding place. Then comes the white throne judgment with everybody in hell is going to come up before the Father and look. And the Father is going to look for their names in the books. And if he doesn't find it, 
then they go into the lake of fire, separated for eternity. So, if, you go, if they're in hell, if somebody's in hell, they will go into the lake of fire, because God will not find their name in there, because back when they were living, they rejected Christ. They had nothing to do with him. And now they're at the judgment seat of Christ, and Christ is going to judge them. They're going to fall on their knees, and they're going to call him Lord. Every knee will bow, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. But then they'll be cast into hell because of their rejection of him. Because he paid the price. No way that a person can do enough good works to override the bad sinful works. It's impossible. Okay? So we need a savior, someone who was perfect, who had no sin. So, so his friendship, our friendship with God the Father, that's the most important thing there is. Not getting a house, a car, have a big piece of property, going on vacation. None of that is important. What's important is our relationship with God the Father. And Jesus paid that price so we can be back into that relationship. So now we can rejoice in our wonderful new relationship with God. Because our Lord Jesus Christ has made us friends of God. When Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death. So death spread to everyone for everyone's sin. It's like, it's like a contagious disease. If you're in a room with somebody who's got a highly contagious disease, you're going to get it. So this disease is worse than any kind of disease on the planet. It's this d disease of sin. Okay? And everybody that came through Adam was, was contaminated with a sinful nature. You know, sin passed from the father. So it passed from Adam and it, this, your sinful nature came from your dad and came from his dad and all the way back to Adam. But because Jesus did not have a human father, Joseph was not his human father, his, his father is God. He had no sin nature. He was just like Adam. The perfect sacrifice. But he had to be tested and he had to be tempted like unto all men. But he did not sin. Adam was tested with that one thing. Don't touch that tree. And he failed. Jesus was tested and tempted like unto all men. Every temptation that could be imagined and even those that can't be imagined came at Jesus from all sides. But he stayed true to what his calling was on this earth. Okay? So, it's, it's sin spread from that one person. Here in Romans 5, we're still in the same chapter. We jump down to verse 15 through 21. It says, but there is a great difference between Adam's sin and God's gracious gift. Okay? For the sin of this one man, Adam, brought death to many. Or everybody, actually. But even greater is God's wonderful grace and his gift of forgiveness to many through this other man, Jesus Christ. So you can see as the book of Romans is trying to explain to the people how Adam brought sin into the world. Jesus, through our faith in him, will remove sin. Now, I had come to Christ. I still have a sin nature, but I now have a born-again spirit, a redeemed soul, okay? So my spirit is born again. Holy Spirit and my spirit have become one. But yet, my flesh can still do sinful things because I still have a carnal nature in my flesh. All right? And so we have to subdue that. We have to stop it from doing sinful things because sinful things brings death. It brings judgment. Okay? So immediately upon sinning, the Holy Spirit convicts us. But if we keep ignoring the Holy Spirit, we will continue to yield to sin and then we got a great problem in our life. Because if we continue in sin, because grace abounds, Romans 6 tells us this, then the only wages for that, the wages of sin, like a, like a balance, the wages of sin, what you're going to get for, for doing sinful things is death. So, looks like a guy works for an hour, he makes $10 an hour, so he makes $10 when he works that one hour. That's the balance. You work an hour, you get $10 for it. That's the agreement. You came into agreement when you took the job. So when you're living in sin, there's a wage coming to that. That balances out that sin. And it is death. Okay? 
and not the kind of death physical, because even Adam died when he ate of the tree, but he didn't die physically. He died spiritually. He was separated from God. He was kicked out of Eden. Okay, He could no longer eat of the trees in the garden. Now he had to go grow his own crops and everything and put up with, with the locusts and, and, and animals and sin and evil and corruption and sickness and everything else that came in. Well, none of that was in the garden. So, same thing here that, you know, I have a sinful nature and when it sins, it's going to cause judgment to begin on it. So on one side there's judgment but on this side is conviction from the Holy Spirit. And if I yield to that conviction and repent, and then it breaks my heart to sin and I keep trying to live right, and it's like impossible because I have a, still have a sinful nature. So every time I mess up, the Holy Spirit convicts me. I repent. I'm washed clean. The judgment goes. Now grace is right there. So, but if I continue in sin and I don't repent, then I'll eventually die again spiritually and be cut off. Romans 6 says that. The wages of sin is death. Separation from God. Okay? I'm sealed unto the day of salvation once I get saved. There's a seal on me. But I can break that seal if I continue in sin. Now, I'm going to sin stumble and fall and yield to sin at times, but the first thing that's going to happen is conviction. And if I don't repent, my heart will start getting harder and harder to where I don't hear that conviction anymore. And then when I stand before Christ, he'll say, I never knew you. Who are you? In other words, I left him and continued in sin. So I have to fight against this. There's going to be a fight. There's going to be war between your spirit and your flesh. All the days of your life. But you're going to get stronger if you keep repenting and you're feeling the grief of the sin. You're going to keep getting stronger by faith. And soon, with a lot of these sins in your life, you'll be able to say no to that temptation. You'll put safeguards into your life. Like when I have a bad dream, a filthy dream, I wake up and I just start worshiping. And those thoughts go away and I go back to sleep. When I get tempted in this life, I can either fall into the temptation, which then I feel the guilt and the shame, or I can, I can resist it by submitting to God. It says in James, submit to God in chapter 4, and resist the devil, and he will flee. Okay? So there's a battle, there's a war. We're in a war, and the war isn't between me and the devil. I can't beat him. Holy God has already dethroned him. But I can't beat him because I'm not strong enough. But I can repent. I can resist him. And I do that by worshiping God right in the midst of the temptation. Now I fail many times. And, and we all fail. But then we feel bad. And we feel the shame. Christians ask me all the time, how long will I keep falling over the same thing? I said, till you become strong. Till you grow up. Till you become a mature Christian. And you look at that thing for what it is. You know, Paul wrote in, in 1 Corinthians 13, he said, when I was a child, I did childish things. But when I became a man, I put away those childish things. You see, so when you grow up and become a mature Christian, you'll be able to put away these sexual things and these, and these evil things and, and so forth. But if you, don't, if you don't repent, those sins will keep coming up and you'll never grow up. You'll be letting filthy things come out of your mouth. You'll stay looking at trash all your life. You know, and, and eventually you won't even feel God anymore. You won't feel him because you have resisted him. And because you love this world. There's been, there was bunches of people in the Bible that, that walked away from Christ and went back to the world. You know, you can go read about them. They actually give you some of their names. Amen. So we have this wonderful gift. It's worth hanging on to. A price was paid. It's a free gift. But the problem with something that's free is that we usually just abuse it and take it for granted. If it costs you something, we usually take care of it a little bit better. Okay? And that's true. So we have to understand that even though it's a free gift, the free gift that we've been given is life. And that costs a price. 
And, that, and the reason why we still have to fight against sin is because, you see, you need to understand how important it is to make it to heaven. And that's where the fight comes in, and that's when the value comes in. Is heaven valuable to you? Is it worth you fighting your flesh, resisting the devil, in order to make it to heaven? Some people think, say, they, oh, you're sealed, you won't ever lose your salvation. But you know, you have a free will. Some say, no, you don't have a free will, God owns us. Well, it's all very confusing out there. But I want you to know you do have a free will. You're all making choices. When you come to Christ, the Bible says it's better for you not to have come to Christ than to come to him and turn away. All right? So, and it says here in 16, and the result of God's gracious gift is very different from the result of that one man's sin. For Adam's sin led to condemnation, but God's free gift leads to our being made right with God, even though we are guilty of many sins. You see, we're still having sin issues. But we come to Christ and it's a free gift. For the sin of this one man, Adam, caused death to rule over many. But even greater is God's wonderful grace and his gift of righteousness. For all who receive it will live in triumph over sin and death through this one man, Jesus Christ. All right? We will triumph over our temptations. Triumph over the guilt. Eventually, when I, if I physically die... I go to heaven where I have no more sin nature. If the rapture takes place, his body will be changed, and I'll have no more sin nature. And I go live with the Lord forever. Okay? So, through one man, sin came. Through Jesus Christ, salvation came. Yes, Adam's one sin brings condemnation for everyone. But Christ's one act of righteousness brings a right relationship with God and new life for everyone. Because one person disobeyed God Many became sinners, but because one other person obeyed God, many will be made righteous. You can see throughout this chapter and in the book of Romans too, he keeps going back to this. Because it's important that you understand that you didn't earn your salvation. It cost a great price. When we come to Christ, we start coming to the reality of what it cost him to pay for our salvation. And even though we didn't pay for it, but we've been given a, a mental picture and a heart that understands. Jesus did not have to die on that cross for us. We all could have just been wiped out of existence or all went to hell. But he came and paid for us. That alone makes me fight. When I see what he has done for me, if I, if I rescue somebody from death, that person has got a free gift. I gave him a free gift. I risked my life for them. They don't have to worship me or so forth. But they should try to live a good life because they were rescued, okay? Now, this is a whole bigger picture that Jesus Christ saved me from eternal damnation. And I should try to live a holy life to please him. He, he did it. He didn't have to. But he loved us so much that he saved our souls if we believe in him. So important. God's law was given so that all people could see how sinful they were. But as people sinned more and more, God's wonderful grace became more abundant. Okay, so what he's saying? He's saying, not one sin, except for blaspheme in the Holy Ghost, which I won't talk about right now, but any sin, even blaspheming God, even Jesus, you can repent and get your sins washed away. All right? So his grace is greater than any sin you could ever commit. People say, you just don't know what I've done. You know, there's murderers out there that people are trying to witness to in prison. And they say, you just don't know what I've done. They say, no, I don't, but God knows what you've done. And you can repent. If you truly repent, you can be forgiven from all of that. You know, so Jesus paid the price for the worst criminal. Paid the price for the worst sins that imaginable. And... All you have to do, and it's very hard for a person that has tremendous sins to really do it. The devils will torment these people and everything, but they can come to Christ. Okay? So just as sin ruled over all people and brought them to death, now God's wonderful grace rules instead, giving us right standing with God and result in an eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So, to sum up everything, 
It's a free gift to God. You couldn't pay for it. You don't have enough money. You don't have enough time. You don't have enough energy. On and on it goes. You just cannot do it. You would have to go into hell and in the lake of fire for eternity. It would take eternity, which never ends, to pay for your rejection of Christ. Okay? So, what do you do? Well, you humble yourself and receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. It doesn't take a whole lot. Romans 10.10 10 says, believe in your heart, confess with your mouth. You don't have to go do anything except believe in your heart. You just say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you paid for my sins. I wasn't worthy of that, but you did. You died on the cross for me. And all I needed to do is to believe that you paid for my sins by faith. And I believe you did. And open up your mouth and say this out loud, you know, as you're praying. And say from your mouth what you believe in your heart. I believe Jesus died for me. I believe he paid for every one of my sins. I believe all my sins is cast as far as the east is from the west. I believe they're never going to be remembered again. I also believe that if I turn away from Christ, all my sins will come back. And this I hope and pray that the Holy Spirit will help me. Help me to stay true. Convict me of my sins. And help me to stay focused on my salvation. I believe that heaven is a wonderful place. And I want to go there. So I yield and surrender to you, Lord Jesus. Father, help me. Help me to just understand what Jesus went through. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.